What's going on, everybody? On today's episode of the No Huddle Show, we are talking about the arrest and release of cornerback Daryl Worley, a move that obviously came by surprise and now puts the Eagles' cornerback position. Uh, it, it changes things. I mean, it just it simply changes things for now uh, and the NFL draft. So we're going to talk about how it impacts the roster and how it might impact their uh, their plan with the NFL draft now about two weeks away. Also, OTAs are underway. The Eagles are back at the Novacare Complex. We're going to talk about what they should do with Brandon Graham and some of the biggest storylines now that the team is back voluntarily at the Novacare. And finally, Des Bryant is a free agent. Um, what should the Eagles do? And would they have interest had they not signed Mike Wallace? Um, Des is obviously still one of the better receivers in the league, so we're going to talk about whether the Eagles should make a run at signing him. But before we get underway, I just wanted to remind everybody – Please subscribe to the podcast. You can get us on any podcast app. You, you, you re, any podcast app out there. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Spreaker. And once you subscribe, we'd really appreciate those five star reviews. Uh, leave a review, put a question in it, and we'll make sure we answer it. Um, or if you're listening on YouTube, give us that thumbs up. But then go ahead and subscribe. So we really appreciate it. So let's get this podcast underway. All right, Elliot Shore Parks here with Zach Rosenblatt. Zach, we always say this, but never a dull moment on the Eagles beat. And you've only been here like two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I joked to you uh, on Sunday. I'm like, I, it would be nice to get like a, a Sunday off during the right. offseason. <laughs> it's it all, always happen. something. You wake up in the morning and somebody's getting arrested or released or traded. And yeah, it's never a dull moment. That's for all sure. Right. So Daryl Worley, um, a guy that obviously they traded receiver Torrey Smith for about a month ago, um, Sunday morning. Uh, the police report has not been released yet, so all of these facts are basically uh, via the NFL Network report. But Daryl Worley arrested 6 a.m. on Sunday, um, was passed out. Uh, I guess when they woke him up, he was combative with, with police officers. They had to tase him to calm him down, was eventually arrested. And uh, there was a and gun there was a gun present, by the way. Yeah, right. And there was a gun found in the car. So overall, not a great situation. And I thought that before we get into the football impact of this, I thought that Ike Reese from 94 VIP made a really good point when he said, you know, football aside, this situation really could have turned out a lot worse. And we should be thankful that Worley wasn't hurt. Um, you know, there was no police officers hurt. Nobody else on the road was hurt. So, you know, that aside, Worley's still a 23 year old guy. And no matter what happens, no matter what happened, I think we can both say we hope he bounces back from this, you know, just just as a human, because it's a tough it's a tough situation for him, football aside. But uh, here on the No Huddle Show, obviously, we're here to talk about the impacts this has on the Eagles. So I think the three main questions are one, was the decision to release him the right one? Two, how does this make us go back and revisit the trade? And three, what does it mean from the roster from here on out? And, I mean, the fact that they released him so soon, in my opinion, was pretty startling. Yeah, I think that says a few things. It says, number one, you know, they they need to get ahead of this PR thing because they already are dealing with the Michael Bennett situation. And I think you've talked a lot about their locker room and how important that was to their run, and they kind of want to protect that at all costs. But at the same time, I think it also means that they didn't view Daryl Worley as, like, an imperative to them winning games this season. So they're like, all right, why why would we even, like, risk the all the hubbub that will come with this and let's just get ahead of it, get so rid of him and. That- that's where I not to interrupt, but that's where yeah. I kind of disagree with you. So I, I do think they did really like Daryl Worley. I mean, when they talked about him um, at the owners meetings, uh, how he said this was a guy they targeted in the draft when he came out, but he ended up getting selected before uh, they were they were up in the third round, um, even though. A lot of people, and this has been in my Twitter mentions a lot, people saying like, well, they were going to cut Tory Smith anyway. Well, first of all, you don't know that. Like, Tory Smith tweeted yesterday to Mike Garofalo yeah, that, that yeah that that nobody knows what's going to happen, which to me implies a little bit that maybe they talked about a restructure, which isn't the craziest thing in the world when you think about the fact that Tory Smith had a good playoff run, was a veteran guy, knew the offense, and if he was willing to restructure, I think it makes sense. But so the, uh, so just to your point that I don't think that they were like, oh, Dar- Daryl Worley wasn't going to make the team anyway. It wasn't like this was a practice squad guy. I think they had genuine interest in keeping Daryl Worley. Well, and had this not happened, I think he would have made the roster and played quite a bit. Well, that, that's not necessarily what I was saying. I just meant like this guy was at best going to be their number four corner and maybe a backup safety. So it, are you, it's not really worth keeping a guy like that around as opposed to, 
you know, Michael Bennett, who's still on trial, you know, he's not necessarily guilty and he's a valuable pass rusher that they added. Mm-hmm. So I, I just don't think it, it hurts them as much losing Daryl Worley as maybe it would if one of their starting players got arrested. And I mean, I, I, that it's a double standard and it's, it's unfair and it stinks, but that's just the reality of sports. They, 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 you know, you're seeing it with the 49ers right now, they cut a guy last year, I forget his name after, and then he was found not guilty a few weeks later. And then Ruben Foster had this terrible charge come out where he like beat up his girlfriend allegedly. Right. And they're, they're like, we're just suspending him for right now. Like it, it's a double standard. If you're a good player, the, the reality is the NFL wants to keep you around at all, at, at, as long as they possibly can. So I, mm-hmm. I just don't think they, they saw that attachment to Daryl Worley is all I, I was saying. So Howie, Howie or Doug or anybody from the organization hasn't talked yet. Um, Howie's going to talk on Thursday of this week, so we'll get some answers in on Daryl Worley. But just reading the tea leaves, my guess is how the situation went down on Sunday was something like this. Um, they found out about the incident. Uh, they looked into it. They found out the details. And I just think that this came down to trust. And the Eagles have shown in the past that they're willing to stick by guys that get in you know, these, these legal issues. I mean, they stood by Nigel Bradham, who to your point was someone they needed badly at the time, but they didn't stick by Josh Huff when he had his incident with the gun. And to me, I really think this, it just comes down to trust. The Eagles have to trust that the incident that happened, A, you were completely honest with the team about what happened and B, they have to trust that you won't do it again. And when it comes to Worley, I think that the reason he's no longer here is probably that the answer B there, because Uh, You know, Joe Pearson from the Charlotte Observer tweeted on Sunday that, you know, the word that he was getting from the Panthers was one of the reasons they traded Worley was because they questioned his commitment and that he was he was in in love with the nightlife. Um, So although we don't know for sure if Worley was drinking, um, you know, it was and he got arrested at 6 a.m. So I think I think (laughs) on a Sunday. Yeah, (laughs) right. So I think it's safe to say he was probably out the night before. But I, I just think the Eagles probably when they traded for Worley hopefully they knew about this because they always say they do research into guys. Um, I'm not saying it would, it wouldn't be like with the Michael Bennett thing. If the Seahawks knew about it, they should tell him. I wouldn't say in this instance that the Panthers would have to tell the Eagles that they question Worley's like commitment. That's just not how it works, but you do your research into a guy. Um, so hopefully they did know it, but, and, and I think this really shows that they did. I think that when they traded for Worley, they probably knew, some of the issues that apparently the Panthers had with him, and he was on a short lease, a short leash. And to have this happen before OTAs even begin, I think they probably said to themselves, like, yeah, we really like this guy. We're probably going to play him. Don't need him as much as Bennett, but I still think, still think they need him to a certain degree. Um, and I think they said, we can't trust going forward that this won't happen again. Um, and so ultimately, I think that's why they released him and didn't wait. I don't think it has to do with anything that else is going to come out on the police report. I don't think it particularly has to do with like all the, you know, being passed out allegedly on the highway and the gun. I don't think it has to do with that. I just think it has to do with the fact that this is an incident he had so soon after trading for him. And I think they just decided going forward, they're not sure if they could trust him. Yeah. And and I don't know if, this factor didn't do it, but you you know they know that this is true. That like the optics aren't great when two guys that you acquired like less than a month right. ago are in trouble with the law without w- before even stepping on the Novacare complex practice field. Like it's that's just the reality. It's not a good look. It's it's not this. This is nothing they necessarily could have prepared for. You don't know that a guy is going to pass out in his car on a Sunday mm-hmm. morning. But uh, but yeah, they, I think I I don't know. We. we, we you can question whether it was right to do it so quickly just in terms of the well-being of Daryl Worley, but maybe that's not the Eagles' concern. They're worried about the organization, and this is probably the right move. Yeah, and look, when this happened, I wrote on Sunday that they have to protect the locker room culture. And it's funny how now so many Eagles fans agree with that when Chip Kelly was saying, you got to protect the culture. Everyone was like, oh, come on, like it's about football. <laughs> have to and, bring Chip into this, don't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. You got to bring Chip <laughs> into it. But no, I mean, I think there's some truth to it, and the Eagles – just just showed last season that I mean they were in they were a very talented team but they won because of the culture they built in that locker room their ability to overcome adversity their ability to stick together their ability to play together and I'm not saying Daryl Worley or Michael Bennett will come in and disrupt that but in 2017 the Eagles didn't deal with any arrests during the season or really during the offseason and now they've already got two from two guys they traded for so look, I mean, Daryl Worley, maybe he would have came in if they would have stuck by him. Maybe he would have, 
you know, hopefully knock on wood, you know, like hopefully t- turned his life around. Right. And he, yeah. maybe he would, but I just don't think it's a, it's not a risk that they were, they were willing to take, especially when you take into account the locker room and how important it is for Doug Peterson. I mean, you've heard it. And Doug Peterson has said it time and time again, that the key to repeating is going to be that locker room, how the Eagles players handle success, how they handle being, re, you know, uh, defending champions. So I just think they're valuing that locker room so much more than they probably ever have, probably even more than last season, seeing how, how important that was. And so ultimately, I think they had they they felt they had to release him. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and that, I mean, you talked a lot about how you think he's going to play a big role. I, I maybe not a big role, but a role. And I while I agree with that, I I mean, we, we can talk about this now. I guess I, I thought th- I thought they might have drafted a cornerback anyway when he was on the roster. Mm-hmm. And now I think it necessitates it even more. But if they had drafted a corner, I'm not sure he would have been necessarily the lock to make the roster that that you think. But yeah, I I. I, I I get a feeling that it's almost guaranteed that they draft a couple of defensive backs in this draft now. Right. Well, before before we get too deep into the to, into that, I wanted to talk about um, you know the decision to release him. So just real quick, do you agree with the decision to release him? Yeah. Yes or I, 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 I mean, yeah, I, I agree with it. Okay, I think I do too. I think I do too. Um, you know, had they stuck by him, I wouldn't have hated that move or ripped him. But I think ultimately, you know, they're a business in the public eye and. Uh, you know, it's a bad look for them. And I think so that, that visits my, that, that brings us to the next question, which is revisiting the trade. So mm. when the trade was made, everybody, as they always do when the Eagles make a trade, just praised Howie to no end, you know, <laughs> calling him a magician. And look, I've said it, I'll say it again. Like I was wrong. I, I didn't think Howie was a good general manager. They won the Super Bowl last year. So it, it just is what it is. I mean, Howie has that ultimate trump card and he can play it basically whenever he wants for probably the next four years. So I just think, you know, whenever a move is made, people are always like, and especially this case, how did he, how did he rip off the Panthers like that? Like, what are the Panthers thinking? How did Howie pull this one off? Like they were going to cut Tory Smith anyway. Like what a magician. Well, look now, I mean, let, you know, two months later, this guy is no longer on the roster and, you know, you can say, well, they, you know, they gave up Tory Smith and was that, uh, you know, they're not giving up much there, but at the same time, they had to deal now with the public embarrassment of this. So if you, so I'll ask you this, if the Eagles could go back, would they do this trade again? You know, I, I just feel like how he knew he was taking a risk. Cause I think we talked about this last week. Uh, the Panthers gave up a 23 year old cornerback on a rookie contract for an aging receiver coming off the worst year of his career who might've mm-hmm. been cut. Maybe not. Who knows? And you don't, you just don't do that. You don't give away young affordable talent because Worley has flash talent in his time in the league. And I just think, I think Howie was aware of that and he probably questioned why the Panthers are willing to give up Daryl Worley. I don't know if he pursued him or if they offered him up, right. but I, I, I think, I think how he knew what he was getting into, he knew the risk and I, he probably would have, would have done the same thing. It, it just, it was, it was low risk move necessarily. I, I know it didn't work out and he deserves criticism for that, but it, it was, it was a move I think worth taking because there's some potential there. You could get a guy for cheap and you have him on a cheap deal. And I, I think the, the deal makes a lot of sense in hindsight. It just wasn't a good one. So I think that, like I just said, if Howie gets to play the ultimate trump card with winning the Super Bowl, then he takes ultimate blame when things don't work out. And that's my opinion on this. I think that Howie has shown a willingness to take chance on guys. And to bring back up Chip, people got mad during Chip's time with the Eagles because he wasn't. And, and yeah, I remember people saying, people whose football ball opinions I respect, saying, look, to, you know, you can't have a locker room with 53, you know, angels that the, the reality is in the nfl some guys have red flags and you have to take chances on guys and how he's done a good job with that i mean he stuck by nigel bradham um he drafted jalen mills in the seventh round of the nfl draft who you know he had red flags um and he's proven to not only be a very good player for them but to be a big locker room guy he does a lot of community stuff so how he deserves credit for the chances he's taken and he gets that credit and if you're going to give him the credit when it works out, you have to blame him when it doesn't, in my opinion. And, you know, you people have said, have tweeted to me, well, you know, how, how's he supposed to know he was going to pass out at 6 a.m. on a Sunday? Well, Howie's not supposed to know the exact incident that's going to happen, but Howie and the front office are supposed to know what type of guys are bringing in this locker room. And 
my guess is they, like I said earlier, they knew the potential, the potential for this to happen. They knew that Worley probably had some, you know, behind the scenes, the Panthers had some concerns about him in Carolina and, you know, how he, I say, I'll say whatever I want about Howie, bad picks, all that. He's not a dumb guy. Howie's incredibly smart. And if me and you can sit here and say, well, why are they trading a 23 year old corner? Howie's probably thinking that too. So Howie knew this was a risk and it's not a black eye. That's, you know, a bit strong, but look, I mean, the Eagles are opening up OTAs today and everybody's talking about the 23 year old corner that got arrested abroad in Patterson. So it's not a good PR look for them. Um, and ultimately if, they could do the trade again. I would, I would hope they wouldn't, knowing what they do now. Um, just because, you know, you take these chances and it's a bad look for Howie. So um, I, I think Howie does deserve, you know, a fair amount of blame here um, for for what happened. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's a loss. It's an L on his resume. I think that's mm-hmm. that's pretty clear. Uh, I, I just also think it says a lot about where the Eagles are at in this organization that. We're all talking about a guy that was going to be the fourth string cornerback, and it's like the biggest controversy of the offseason. I mean, that, that I know it, it's a big deal. Maybe it's not as big of a deal as you know everybody's making it out to be, but I, I think that uh, the fact that we're, their biggest controversy is surrounding a defensive end that they acquired and uh, their number four cornerback and everybody else on the roster is coming back and they can replace Daryl Worley pretty easily. I think I, I think that it says a lot about how good of shape they're in. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's a loss on his resume, that, that's for sure. Well, let's, let's talk about the corner, corner position. Um, I think now probably the chances of them trading somebody are pretty, I don't want to say zero, but I would say slim. Just because now with Worley gone, I mean, they have – I would assume Jalen Mills, Ronald Darby as their starters, Sidney Jones as the guy that will come in on nickel and probably have Mills slide to the inside. But those will be your three corners that play the most snaps. And you still have Rasul Douglas, kind of the forgotten man in all of this. But, um, I, you know, they could still trade a guy and, and draft one. I, I mean, I still think Darby is probably the top guy to go just because they haven't re-signed him and he's entering the last year of his deal. But I do think now with really gone, the chances of them making a deal slim down considerably. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty obvious. I, I still do think it's possible that they consider moving dark. If there's like a guy that drops in the first round, maybe a little farther, and he's in the 20s or something, I could see them trying to package Darby and, and a pick or something like that to try and move up a few picks. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty unlikely they move a guy and then they rely on another rookie to be a mm-hmm. starter. And Sidney Jones is, for all intents and purposes, like kind of a Ben Simmons-esque rookie. Uh, yeah. which, which, that's a whole nother NBA. Debate, I was saying, yeah, don't, yeah, we're going to have Sydney walking around in rookie, uh, rookie sweaters next year. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think they're, they're still in really good shape. I mean, we, it's kind of funny, you know, a year ago, everybody thought cornerback was probably their biggest weakness. It was the biggest question mark. They got Daryl Worley. It seemed like they had embarrassment of riches at that point. They were still negotiating with Patrick Robinson to bring him back. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wound up going to the saints for a huge deal, but they're, they're, they're super talented. They, Maybe aren't as experienced, but every uh, everybody on the roster has Super Bowl experience now. So I guess that's right. the only experience that matters. So uh, I I think they're going to draft one. Uh, I think it makes sense to pick a guy who doesn't necessarily need to play right away. Maybe he's a guy who can can play in the return game, like Mike Hughes from Central Florida is a guy I have my eye on. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to play him at corner as much this year, but you can have him on the roster and develop him for when Ronald Darby inevitably. Because right. I, I don't think they're going to resign Darby. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm torn on that as well. I kind of think Darby, you could tell me, will be playing for their team in week one. You could tell me he'll have a new deal by week one. You could tell me he plays next year and the Eagles sign him to a big deal. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen with Darby just because I think he has the talents, but his season was so up and down last year that it's hard for me to say what you're going to get from him. And I think that's the thing about the Eagles cornerback position that leads me to think they might draft a corner is just that, again, you know, Darby's. I'm going to be for agent next year. Sidney Jones is still a question mark at this point. I think he's probably the most talented cornerback on the roster, but you just don't know what you're going to get from him. Jalen Mills, there's no bigger, you know, supporter of Jalen Mills in terms of trying to, you know, defend that he's a good player in the city than me, but he's probably still like a number two ish borderline number one corner. So I still think there's a need there, but the question is like, so they're sitting there at 32. I think they do take best player available, and that's a luxury they're in. But I don't know, man. A corner at 32, that would be a pretty big indication they're going to move on from somebody in a year. And I'm not so sure that's really the best use of a resource, especially if you're not trading back. 
Yeah, I, I just think I agree with you, but I, I just think, like you said, they're going to take the best player available. So if there's a cornerback that they have at number 16 on their board and he falls to 32, like a, you know, someone like Josh Jackson from Iowa, mm-hmm. I think I think he could go from a very wide range of things. He had like eight interceptions at Iowa last year. He's talented. Right. I mean, like if a guy like that is at 32, I, I don't think Howie would really hesitate to pick him and, unless there's a defensive lineman that they also had high in the board. Like it, there's just so many factors with the number 32 pick. And if there's no guys there that they like, then they'll trade back. So it's uh, I, I think they can draft a corner. There's a couple guys I think would be worth it. But yeah, like, I mean, they're they're drafting a guy who's going to be their number five cornerback in, in, in essence. So I don't know if that's a great pick, but yeah, I, I just think they're going to take the best guy. And if that's a corner, mm-hmm. it's a corner. So the other big piece of NFL news since last time we we recorded a podcast was the Cowboys released receiver Des Bryant. And, you know, it's funny whenever somebody is released and then I either tweet about it, I'm sure you get the same thing. People are just kind of like, well, there's no way they're going to sign Des. Why are they even why? Why are you even tweeting about it? And I'm just like, you do realize that when a player gets released, even the Eagles briefly talk about it. And it would be negligent for them not to talk mm-hmm. about it. I'm not saying it's an hour and a half. It's a full day. I'm just saying whenever a player is released, it's the Eagles job to consider signing him and see what that option would be. So Des Bryant, obviously, uh, you know, former cowboy at this point, um, people were joking. He could do the the reverse T.O. and go from, you know, the Eagles, to Cowboys from the Cowboys, to the Eagles. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't think I would sign him, especially now that they have Mike Wallace. Um, but I mean, would you, I'm, I wouldn't, but I, I mean, I, I don't think it would be like a bad thing if they did either. Like I, I know, I think if they signed him, it would probably be an indication that they aren't as confident in Mac Collins as we all thought they might have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, 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 th- I kind of thought about it and like, you see what they do with their defensive line group. They, they rotate everybody constantly. So everybody's fresh. I mean, you, you could see it, it, it would be kind of a unique thing to do to have five receivers that you're just constantly subbing in and out. Uh, but also on Jeffrey's coming off an uh, injury. I mean, I, I, I talked myself into it a little, I could, see, I, I don't know. It'd, it'd be interesting to see if he would fit into the dynamic of that locker room and, and uh, if they would want to do something like that and bring in a guy who could, you know, flank the other outside with, with Alshon Jeffrey, it'd be, that sounds right. pretty intriguing to me, but yeah, I mean, it, that would just be a pretty, pretty clear indication that they don't want to give Mac Hollins a bigger role, which I think they do, which is in part why I don't think they're actually going to consider it. Yeah, I don't think they'll consider it either because of how much money they gave Mike Wallace. Yeah, um, and, and they don't have any cap space right now, really. Right. But the other thing I will say is, like, you can't deny, and Eagles fans can't deny that, in terms of just purely talent, I mean, he would probably step on this roster and be, if not number one. I mean, he he's just as good in a lot of ways as Alshon. Like, I understand. He is on the decline, but yeah. He is. He is. But, I mean, the decline is still... Yeah, he, I mean, from where he was to now, yeah. Right, I mean, he had 16 touchdowns in a season. So I yeah. still think he's he's very good, and that that's not a shot at Alshon. I just think he's still, you know, a top 20-ish type receiver, 25-ish type of guy. Um, and there's no denying the Eagles, as just football talent-wise, are better with him on the roster. But like you said, um, I do think they want to give Mike uh, Matt Collins some some snaps, and they gave Mike Wallace a cap hit of up to $4 million, so that's – you know, it's basically what they were paying Torrey Smith. So I do think they view him as a guy that's going to get a lot of snaps. And the other thing is, if you're Dez, why would you come here? Because you're going to, to play, probably sign to play a- Dallas twice a year. Yeah, to play, yeah, exactly. Although <laughs> I think, I mean, I get why he would want to make his decision based off that, but that's kind of silly. <laughs> um, but if you if you're Dez and you come here, you're going to be. Let's say everybody's healthy. You're going to be beside. You're going to be behind Alshon, Aguilar, and Ertz at least. You're going to be behind the running game. So you're talking about being the fifth option on offense. And then you can debate if you're even behind Mike Wallace. So I really do think that Dez coming here would kind of be the recipe for disaster just because he's shown in the past. I mean, he's a little more of a volatile guy than the Eagles have brought in. (laughs) I mean, Alshon on a one year deal, I thought had some potential for disaster. But knowing what I know now about Alshon, I mean, he has always been kind of a quiet guy and he was in Chicago, too. Um, so I just think bringing in Dez, we just talked about the locker room and how much that means. I think it just ultimately isn't worth it. But I'll throw this by you. Had they not signed Mike Wallace and Mac, Mac Collins was still their number two and everyone was talking about them drafting a receiver, then do you think they would have interest? Yeah, it's, uh, that's an interesting hypothetical. Uh, I think they would have explored it at the very least. Uh, 
I mean, you mentioned he he's Des Bryant. Like I know he's right. his stats were way down last year, and I don't think he's as athletic as he used to be. Uh, I don't know if he could take on the workload of like the guy where he's getting double teamed, but he wouldn't have had to do that in Philadelphia. So you put him and Alshon on the outside, and you have Nelson Aguilar, you know, in the slot. That, that sounds pretty unstoppable to me. And uh, yeah. and you know Carson Wentz has the ability to throw it up to a guy and place it well enough that they can go up and grab it. So uh, the Eagles are going to do whatever makes their team the best. And without Mike Wallace here, uh, he, Des Bryant might make their team better than Mike Wallace would have. I know Wallace adds a speed element that they don't necessarily have right now, and I think that's going to be very valuable. But Mike Wallace, you know, has only had a couple thousand yard seasons in his entire career. I think two years ago he had one. Uh, he is older than Des, I believe. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Des just at his best, you know, there's few receivers that are better than him. So I, I think they would have explored it. I don't know if it would have happened. I don't know if Des would have actually wanted to come here where he's not going to be the number one option, but I think it would have been a discussion. Mm-hmm. I agree. Especially, I mean, how he's shown he's never afraid of those big splashy moves. So I think it would have been a discussion, but to get to the Eagles' current roster with Dez not on it and Daryl Worley not on it, the Eagles did begin OTAs this week. Um, they are voluntary, but in the NFL, nothing's ever truly voluntary. And I do think the Eagles expect all of their players to be there. Um, so I guess to me, the biggest question mark, and by the time you guys are listening to this, we might already know the answer. But to me, the biggest question mark is Brandon Graham, whether he shows up or not. And I feel pretty strongly that he he should not show up. Um, you know, he wants a new deal. He should have gotten one last year. And since since he's asked the Eagles for a new deal, he's seen them, you know, overall, not necessarily since, but overall over the past few years, Fletcher Cox gotten a big deal. Timmy Jernigan's gotten a big deal. Vinny Curry got a big deal. They, they redid Chris Long's deal, and they drafted Derek Barnett in the first round. So he's seen his uh, power, his, like, leverage really disappear. Um and I do think that he should not show up for voluntary o- for, for OTAs. And I would consider skipping the mandatory ones, too, if I were him, to, to get that new deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you would know Brandon Graham's you know, personality and kind of how he approaches things a little better than I would. But I, I'm just curious if he looks at all those moves and sees what they're doing and takes that as a shot at him and kind of, you know, whether he shows up for the offseason stuff or not, I wonder if he just mm-hmm. accepts that this is his last year in Philadelphia and – kind of just attacks it that way and tries to boost his value for next year. I, I, I mean, they, they gave Chris Long a contract, a, a new contract. They pretty much begged him to come back. They traded for Michael Bennett. You know, they drafted Derek Barnett last year. If they draft another defensive end uh, in, a, in a little over a week, I think mm-hmm. that's going to kind of be the nail in the coffin for him coming back next year, in my opinion. So I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, you, you can touch on this, I guess, a little better than I could, but I, I'm, I'm curious what he thinks about all of that and if he's going to just, all right, I'm going to hold out until you pay me now because I see you're willing to give defensive ends money or if he's going to be like, all right, well, this is my last year in Philadelphia. I'm going to enjoy it. You know, just from what I know – of Brandon Graham. To me, he seems like a guy that would genuinely miss being in the building. And I think sitting at home for him would be really hard. I Mm -hmm. don't think he would like come back out of shape or anything. I just think he would miss being around the guys. Um, And I think if he held out, it would be something he wouldn't do lightly. I don't think he would just do it to do it. I think he would do it with a commitment to get a new deal. And I think Brandon Graham wants to be here, but the big part of the Brandon Graham thing is he's never gotten that mega contract. I mean, he's, you know, I think he's 30 now and he, he re-signed with the Eagles once. And I mean, he, he obviously still has, you know, more money than most people ever will, but he's never gotten that, you know, $40 million guaranteed deal. And he's played like he deserves it. And again, his leverage right now, he just clinched the Super Bowl for him. He was voted a team captain. He's a vocal leader. Like the Eagles don't, I don't think, you know, all things being equal, they don't want Brandon Graham to leave. I mean, they trust him. They think he's a good guy, all those things. But Howie has said multiple times that the cap's an issue and, you know, they can only sign so many players, not speaking specifically at Graham, but just talking in general. Um, And I think that my my guess is behind the scenes, they've probably, you know, told Graham no about his his new deal. And I think maybe at the right price, they would resign him. But the one thing I'll say is like the teams always kind of say it reading between the lines. You know, some people feel you have a better chance just coming to OTAs and kind of showing that goodwill gesture. But to me, Graham showed that last year. And I don't think showing it again will be any more impactful. I mean, the Eagles already know he's a good soldier. Like, he, he's a good locker room guy. They already know all those things. And I just think if he really wants to be in Philly long term, this is the time to make it happen. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think Brandon Graham's such an interesting case because, you know, you look at his career, he, he pretty much wasn't a full-time starter, I think, to like 2014. Uh, he People labeled him a bust pretty quickly because he wasn't really contributing for those first few years with Chip and uh, Andy right. Reid. And, and he kind of, he his, his career has kind of taken a turn into him becoming elite in the last like three or four years. And maybe even last really like one or yeah, two. Years. Yeah, one yeah. or two years. I mean, last year was his best year by far. I mean, even right. statistically. I mean, even watching him, I, I test. But I don't know. I, I'm I'm curious what his. I know he he is elite defensive end, and I think everybody in Philadelphia knows that. But if you just look at even just his resume, he's a pass rushing defensive end who's never had ten sacks. I know Pro Bowl isn't the end all be all, but he's never made a Pro Bowl. And right. uh, I'm just curious, like, that's something that teams would use to leverage a cheaper contract. And it's possible that's what the Eagles are doing. And I think that's what other teams are doing, unless they desperately wanted him. Mm-hmm. And he's going to be 30, I think, next year, right? Or 31? I think he might already be 30. Yeah. So, so yeah, he'll be so he'll be 31 going into the next season. And, his, I mean, I know he just hit his stride, so he's kind of a unique case. But I'm just curious how the rest of the league feels about him. Because we haven't, I, I haven't, I, I don't have the connections around the league just yet. But right. I, I, I just... I, I just while we know how good he is, and you have, if you watch the tape, I think you know how good Brandon Graham is. I don't know if his resume kind of jumps out as a guy that you want to, you know, devote the entire cap space to. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would, and I agree with you. The only thing I would say is in this league, bad quarterbacks get paid a lot, and bad defensive ends get paid a lot. So sure. if you're a good one, I really think Graham would cash in quite a bit. I mean, those are just two positions that if you hit free agency. You're real. You're going to get paid if you're even a competent player. So, I mean, his his seven million dollar cap or salary he'll make in 2018 is something like 20th among amongst pass rushers. Yeah, no, that's a steal for sure. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, whether he shows up and what that turns into is one of the biggest storylines. But before we wrap this up, I'll just throw this to you. Um, any other big storylines sticking out with the OTAs? I mean, they're really only doing conditioning and lifting right now, so it's not. You know, it's not whether Wentz is throwing or anything like that, but just curious. I mean, anything else, you know, you're, you're sticking out to you as OTAs began? Not, not necessarily with OTAs, but something I was just thinking about is the, the players from Nelson Aguilar's draft class, their options. I've been seeing guys getting picked up pretty frequently. Mm-hmm. I think the deadline is early May, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm just a little I'm, – I'm wondering why it hasn't happened yet. I, I'm, I'm, I want, I'm curious if they would consider giving him an extension beyond that or – what, I think what, they would definitely like, consider giving. Yeah, I think they. I think they would too. I'm. <laughs> I'm just curious why the option hasn't been announced yet because everybody knows they're going to bring him back. So that just that was just on my mind. It's not necessarily have, having to do with OTAs. Right. But that's just something I've been thinking about. Well, I wonder if he wants to resign here. Oh, touche. <laughs> I mean, like it, you know, it, it could be. It could be, be num- if he thinks he can be a number one guy somewhere else. Right. Or something. Yeah. Well, because to your or even just if he you know wants to live here, I don't know. I mean, he could just want to <laughs> hit free agents. Alley kid, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Cali kid, Florida, that type of thing. Um, But yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of like the Brandon Graham thing, except with Graham, there's the age factor. But it's with the Aguilar thing. It's like it makes so much sense. Why hasn't it happened yet? So I think, yeah, that is a very good point. And like you said, um, like I said earlier in the episode, Joe uh, Douglas and Howie Roseman are going to be talking later this week uh, tentatively. So um, we should have a lot more answers to the stuff we talked about after talking to them, you know, Worley, where Michael Bennett is, Aguilar, Graham, all those things. Um, and we're going to have a podcast for you later in the week, too. So probably on Thursday or Friday, we'll be back with another one. And uh, I mean, just another another exciting week in Eagles in Eagles land. <laughs> <laughs> it's never we'll, we'll find out if we get next Sunday off. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So we will talk to you guys later in the week. Um, Like I said at the beginning, if you haven't subscribed and you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe. Uh, We're on all the major podcast apps. Go leave those five-star reviews. We'll answer the question in the pod uh, that you leave in the five-star review. So, all right. I will talk to you all later this week. And uh, Zach, talk to you later.